I thank you for inviting me here. Uh, so I want to thank a few people for helping me in this idea. Um, back in the 80s, John Beam and Penny Smith and I were involved in discussions about this. And in more recent years, Stefan Zur, Miguel Sanchez, uh, Jonathan Herrera, Jose Luis Flores, Ivan Jose Silva uh, played important parts in helping me uh, get to where I am. Uh, the people involved with causal boundary in, in, in the modern era, myself, Jose Luis Flores, Miguel Sanchez, uh, Jonathan Herrera, Luis Ake, and some of the uh, important names in extendability are Ed Galloway, Eric Ling, and Jan Spierski. So what's this all about anyway? Uh, it starts with uh, interior Schwarzschild. Schwarzschild. like this, crosses S2, but I really only care about the interior portion there. And of course, we famously have the singularity at r equals zero because v is in the interior. I like to write this as minus one over the n of r minus one r squared plus n r minus 1 d squared plus r squared metric on the unit 2 sphere. Uh, so uh, the I, if we interpret the singularity as causal boundary the topology of it is actually r1 cross s2 so it is a co-dimension one hypersurface. It's a manifold with boundary, a very smooth manifold with boundary. Um, of course, metric doesn't extend to it, so there's no C infinity extension. And famously, the, uh, we now know there is not even a C zero extension of, of the metric. So uh, that that's sort of the model for for what I want to look at. Uh, well, all right. How do I know the singularities R1 cross S2? Well, that's the causal boundary. What's the causal boundary? It's the categorically universal boundary construction for putting a, a for adding a future completion to the space time, any, any strongly causal space time. That's uh, part of the, uh, the niceness of the causal boundary. It applies to any strongly causal space time. You don't have to search for any. It's also inherent, in, it's natural. You don't have to look for embeddings or, or anything like that. And as I say, it is the smallest construction that produces a future complete object, uh, cat categorically. Uh, I, I'm not going to do anything further with causal boundary. Uh, I'll just say, yeah, it's, it's, this, it's this construction and it's out there and it works. Uh, there is some small controversy on what the proper topology to use uh, for the causal boundary. Uh, my Spanish colleagues favor one topology, I favor another, but they all agree on something as simple as this. Uh, so what happens here, just note, if we look at typical time-like curves going to the singularity. They're all finite length to the future. So that's what I mean by uh, causal boundary at finite distance at, at a, uh, so that you approach it through time-like curves of, of finite uh, extension into the future. And what about niceness? Well, what we want is this. So by nice, I mean space-like 
going to mention one and, and more. What do I mean by more? Here, R1 cross S2, the boundary, is the R equals zero uh, portion of zero to N cross uh, R1 cross S2, whereas the, uh, the manifold itself, the interior Schwartz shield, is open zero to M cross R1 cross S2. So that's what I mean by more. That what I really want is for the causal boundary to fit in in just this manner. So here's the thing about the causal boundary. Up until now, all published examples of governing the causal boundary have been in highly symmetric space-times or in highly special algebraic constructions. Static or stationary is a little more difficult. Uh, spherically symmetric, uh, warped product, uh, uh, taking the, uh, applying a, a quotient by a group of isometries on a known uh, example. That actually covers just about any classical space-time you care to imagine. But the classical space-times are all very simple geometrically or simple algebraically. I want to be more generic. I want to talk about, well, can we just discover by some means what the causal boundary is in a virtually generic space-time? Well, not every space-time. It has to have some structure. So what structure do I need? Basic idea is we, so M is a strongly causal space-time. And I foliate M by observers. Time-like curves. A family of, of uh, what we just call it, F, foliation. Foliation by time-like curves of the space-time. That's the basic structure. And then I want to uh, apply uh, restrictions that are physically measurable in principle. By this class of observers. So that's the name of the game. Given the class of observers filling space time, what uh, sort of observations, physical observations, uh, can we ask these observers to, to come up with that would allow us to conclude that um, causal boundary is, is nice, space-like, co-dimension one, fits into the space-time in just this manner. And after we answer that question, a further question is, and is there a C0 extension of the metric beyond the causal boundary? As we all know, famously, having an end to what we think of as the space-time is not necessarily the physical end of the space-time. Einstein famously thought that the event horizon was, was the end of, of Schwarzschild. We want to be able to discover ways in 
to have ways in which we might discover that, you know, we're not at, we have a putative end, but it's not really the end. Or at least in a C0 manner, we might be able to go beyond it. I, I should point out that there is a Riemannian result along these lines that uh, Penny Smith and, and Dean Yang uh, mentioned in and the building, it also, they also play a part in this. So in the Riemannian case, Riemannian result says that if I have a manifold M and M minus some point as a metric, can metric G, can G extend to two star? And the answer depends in part on uh, a, a uh, um, sectional curvature uh, must uh, blow up less than, you know, blow up quote unquote, less than quadratically. It's actually an integral condition. Uh, so uh, the Riemannian result is if you have a, an actual singularity, sectional curvature cannot blow up lower than quadratically. If, if, it's, if, if you it's a slower blow up. It doesn't actually blow up, and, and everything is done. C zero. I, I think maybe I don't remember. It, it's a result from the eighties. I'm not positive whether C zero is from infinity. I, I think they actually got C infinity. I, I don't recall. But that's for for a point. We we, we are not at a point. We're at a co-dimension one space like hypercircle. So I have my uh, foliation here. So this is actually assumption number one. Uh, might as well say uh, these gamma Qs are, uh, say, um, unit speed. Assumption number two, uh, each gamma Q is um, future limited. So I might as well uh, parameterize on say minus infinity to zero. Well, it doesn't have to go down to minus infinity. I really don't care about the, how far past it goes. But let, let us parameterize them so that the top, I'm gonna call this, we have tau then, takes m into minus infinity comma zero, where, L equals zero, and if this is gamma Q of T, we have tau of X equals T. That's how I'm defining the, right now, all I can say, it's a function, not even necessarily continuous, from M into R, but at least it, it, that is a well-defined function. Third, third assumption. Tau is differentiable. So for instance, not the following. So this is, well, that could be my, my longer we call it space time, could be a portion of Minkowski space below that that jagged line and, and my foliation could be those curves and, and then the tau there is clearly not continuous, uh, much less not uh, differentiable. 
but uh, this, this is what I want. Oh, I probably should have put in earlier. I'll put it in now. The, the order doesn't make any difference. Um, the foliation has no ancestral pairs. Phrase I like. What does that mean? An ancestral pair would be this, where I have two foliates, and for any x here, for any y there, x is ahead of y. That's ruled out. Something like that happened. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's it's fairly strong. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So so this is this is uh, these four give me a lot of structure. Uh, in particular, the so we, we can now define M. This is pi to Q. Q is uh, M modulo the uh, uh, the foliation. Right? So that just comes from having no ancestral. And this is house dwarf. That's what I. That's what no ancestral pairs buys me. That the the, uh, the, the, the quotient on by the foliation is a house dwarf. <laughs> Uh, Hausdorff manifold. It's not not just Hausdorff. It's Hausdorff manifold. And so now, I have. Uh, I also have tau going to R. So, in fact, tau comma pi takes m homeomorphically to or diffeomorphically to R one cross Q. Well, differentially, here how how. What degree of differentiability it is, I don't really care. So, uh, yes, we, we get uh, quite a, a lot of structure. Oh, more than that, we even get Q has a family of one forms. And I'll parameterize them by now. And of uh, of uh, of metrics, Riemannian metrics. Wow. And my, I can write, I can decompose my metric very nicely, minus g tau, i star, eta tau squared plus i star, h tau. This is what makes everything work. I call eta a drift form. Because it is in this expression precisely where you find a one form for a stationary space time. Uh, the one form that if it is exact, it's actually a, a, a static space time. Uh, so it, eta in that case is, is the. Uh, uh, Form that tells you the wind that blows uh, through the space time. In particular, eta prime, by which I mean d tau, d by d tau, eta tau equals zero, implies each of these gamma q's is a geodesic, and uh, let's see, d a, and also if I add to that d eta tau is zero, then I get that uh, uh, gamma q dot perp is integrable. Uh, you know, that's the rest spaces, the observer rest spaces. So, uh, Ada is, is giving us some good geometric information. And uh, I, so I think of this as Ada is a time-varying drift form, 
and H is a time-varying Riemannian metric. And that's how everything gets analyzed. Oh, yes. I have to put a restriction on the drift form. It must not be large or we lose causality. So I need the sum. So, so yeah, let me say that again. Simply saying that uh, M is strongly, M is causal tells me that the magnitude of eta at any point is less than or equal to one. I want to say that with some uniformity. This is a uniformization of that. The sum number A less than one, the size of eta tau is less than or equal to A. Uh, what do I mean by size? Size as measured by the, the relevant Riemannian metric. Largely, I'm going to ignore the drift form eta, and uh, it, it's really the Riemannian metric that carries all, all the, the weight of things. Now we get to some int more intensely geometric assumptions. So what makes things work in Schwarzschild? Schwarzschild is a warped product. What makes things, what, the, the, what makes the causal boundary nice a space like co-dimension one in a warped product? And the answer is the Riemannian metric can't, uh, the, the space-like component can't go to zero too quickly. So what I need is that uh, for any Q in Q, uh, there exists a neighborhood U of Q in well, what I'm trying to say is for any x in TQQ, one over the length of x as measured in h tau is integrable. Now, integrable in tau, except I have to say it uniform, well, locally uniformly. I mean more than that. We actually need it's just an ignorant u of q such that if I take the soup for p in u of 1 over length x at p in h tau, this thing is integrable. So it's a, uh, in a locally uniform sense, the, uh, the time-dependent Riemannian metric can't uh, make things vanish too quickly. Uh, some pictures here. A couple things that could go wrong. Oh, I need a different color for my curves. So here's Q down here. That's M. Here's my tau equals zero. This is this is the, the future boundary. Here's the past boundary. Here's something that could go wrong. Uh,
Suppose I have curve C in Q. I want to lift it to a curve, let's call it uh, E bar. E bar is a null lift of C. Uh-oh, there's a problem. I don't want that to happen. I don't want to run out of Q in, in tracing my null curve. I have to prevent that from happening. So I need uh, function number seven. I'll simply say that the uh, um, pass boundary is nice. Now what do I need? Here's something very simple. I have one of my foliates, one of my observers here, and I take a look. There's gamma Q of T. Take its past. I intersect them. I want that to get to zero, not to something. Intersect over T less than zero, past of gamma Q of T is empty set. Well, th this tells me that past boundary is nice, it's space-like. Uh, okay, well, if, if such a simple assumption tells me the past boundary is space-like, couldn't I use that for the future boundary? Eh, not so clear. I am assuming that the, past, the future is where things go uncertain and wonky, we don't really know, and that the, the past is friendly and well understood. So I'm willing to put in a heavy-handed condition like this on the past boundary. I want to use more geometric assumptions, physically measurable assumptions for the future boundary. So that's one problem that can happen. Here's another. This is C, C bar runs out of runs out of Q. There, there's before it can continue on. Or a different kind of problem, tau equals zero, uh, is in Q, is in C, Maybe this is C bar. And I run out of tau. C bar runs out of tau before I get to finish it. I want to prevent that from happening. Well, uh, in the dwarf product uh, metrics, uh, what, what you do to prevent that from happening is say, well, if one of our factors in, in the product is non-compact, then the associated uh, metric has to be complete. So uh, that's what we need in this case. We need completeness on, on the time-dependent uh, Riemannian metrics H tau. So function eight, H, H tau is complete. Yeah, that's not good enough. I have to say this in a uniform manner. So um, for any uh, C in Q, there exists a parameterization of C on zero infinity with uh, on some with some interval. I, an infinite interval in zero infinity. It doesn't have to be connected, but it has to go out to infinity. Uh, for all 
C greater than some T naught, the length of C dot of uh, um, C of S. Length of C dot of S in H tau is greater than or equal to length C dot at some S naught. For some S, so there's I and there's S naught, beginning of I. So that's slightly complicated, but saying in a uniform manner, these H tau's all have to be complete. Oh, uh, uh, for any C and Q exiting all compact sets. Every one, but every every C that goes out to infinity, so to speak. So uh, I, I particularly like uh, things like six and seven and eight, and that they depend uh, that they are physical measurements that my class of observers could measure in their own laboratories at at, at each tau. Get a lot with this. You don't yet get enough. The hardest bit. This is the, the hardest, the, the, the stickiest problem, stickiest issue. There's zero. There's in particular. And a sub Q it has its own past. And if I look at a null curve, C, and here's C down here. I now know that my C is not going to run out of Q and it's not going to run out of tau. I will my C bar will be able to go all the way to the end of C and end up at tau equals zero. But what I need, the problem is, the stickiest issue is maybe the past of C bar is a proper superset of the past of the gamma Q. And that would mean that our causal boundary is not actually space-like, but has a, a null portion to it. I have to rule this out. I figured out how to do this just last night. Well, I, I had a re result that worked, but the point is I'm trying to emulate Schwarzschild interior, and uh, up, up to last night, uh, the ways I had preventing this didn't work in Schwarzschild. If it doesn't work in Schwarzschild, it's not good enough, but I, I now have one that does. This is the last assumption needed for the uh, full portion, the niceness of the causal boundary. Yeah. Uh, running, well, I'll first give the, the easy portion. I need if x is, is in my uh, rest space, in, in, in my release space, and I need that if I take the length of x and h tau, and that log of that, and d of that, and then take the operator norm of that one form. What does that mean? So omega operator norm means uh, you know the uh, supremum of uh, omega applied to x, and that's a value defined by the Length of x. That's what I mean by the operator norm of one form. I need this to be integrable. Well, I need a little bit more than that. I have to be, I have to do it locally uniformly. In fact, <coughs> I need that, uh, that there exists a neighborhood u of q. So it's my soup 
over u, operator norm, d, natural log, length, h, length, x. Then, one through nine imply that the future causal boundary of M is uh, it's actually different is differentially uh, Q. And it attaches uh, and is space like. And three attaches to M, which remember is looks like this as zero cross Q in nice and simple comma zero closure cross Q. So that I do have a nice causal boundary in the sum case, one through nine. And these all work in short shield in theory. That's end of part one. Yes. Mm -hmm. Same, same, same differentiability as tau. The tau, tau is the limit on the differentiability class. That's part one. Part two, extendability. Fortunately, that's much shorter. Ah, I get to try my hand at the cleansing operation. Bounded acceleration. Uh, they, 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 well, they're unit speed, but uh, they, they, do they have bounded acceleration? Uh, yes, it's essentially, it's, yeah. Uh, I would say, it was, uh, I, I would say it, it was the, that I have to, where was it, six and seven? Yeah, yes. Uh, it amounts to that can't happen. It's that that that, that this is integrable it is a large part of it. Yeah, the last one, uh, yeah, that may play a role as well. But I, I, I would look first to this assumption here because that's the thing that you know pushes things in, in off to the side. Let's say.
Oh, we will assume a nice causal, future causal boundary. What allows G to have C0 extension? First, the easy way, along each gamma field. No, I'm, I'm still doing the same uh, standard assumption. I probably should see that. Foliation, et cetera. And the answer is a couple ways to state it, but the easier way to state it is uh, for all Q, for all X in, uh, in Q. I look at the sectional curvature of T and X. So T is the... Uh, velocity vector of a foliate. I look at that sectional curve. To take its absolute value, take a square root, it should be integrable. Well, again, that's not quite enough. Uh, actually, we need, there exists a, a neighborhood. Is that really enough? I, I think that's all I need. I don't need that on I don't need the neighborhood on it. Uh, I think I need the two. One can uh, make this somewhat uh, nicer but by looking at, uh, instead of looking at all x's, oh, I should say, is sectional curvature by the Riemannian metric h tau. Uh, no, that's not quite right. No, no, that's not right. The sectional curvature in g of this, I take its length, H tau. That's not quite what I want. That simply tells me G exists at the end of each foliate in, in a non-degenerate manner. One, what if I want C0 along this, the boundary as well? Or C0 in the boundary We need, uh, yes, I, I, now I need to say the neighborhood thing, so I, I need that uh, soup in some neighborhood U of square root absolute K of T comma X measuring H tau is integrable. And, no, uh, actually, actually, less than or equal to. Less than or equal to a, a integrable function. That's what I want. Um, uh, and yeah, soup. We need that. We do need that. And also soup on U of the norm H tau. Covariant derivative as an operator prime. So when I prime it, it's now tensorial. And therefore, I can take its operator norm in H tau. It should also be less than or equal to an integrable function in, in tau. And so some universal, universal in Q. 
these individuals. This guarantees that G0 is C0, G is C0 on the boundary. That is the app. 